Hello, welcome to Awakening TV. I'm Ian Thorpe. I'm a publisher. I'm also a psychotherapist, musician, artist. But today I want to introduce you to one of my authors, Josephine Sellers. Her book, Parallel Worlds, we've just recently published. And uh, I've invited her here today because I think it's very important for people to get some background knowledge of what brought this book about. So, welcome, Joe. Good to be here, Ian. The book, Parallel Worlds, it obviously spans a great deal of time, in fact, most of your adult life. And that may seem uh, a, a far call for a lot of people, how you would fit all of that into one book. Mm -hmm. uh, so many years, so many adventures. Perhaps you'd like to introduce what brought that about in the first place. Um, it does cover a vast span of my life, but there's a lot missing from the book. It's, it's, it is purely the transpersonal side of my life, so that was quite hard to, to separate it all out. Um, the book started as a result of me really journaling. Events were so, felt so bizarre in the world in which we were living, I thought I, I just have to log it. I knew what was happening was unusual. I knew there was going to be much more. So something inside me told me to, to get down and, and log this and, and just live life and log the transpersonal side of it. Why I, I decided that was the part I should log. I, you know, I wasn't trained in transpersonal studies in those days. Uh, my life was in sections. I, as I say, life's been like a hologram. So there's this magic level going on. There was the worldly life, the, raising the children, running businesses. But there was this magic going on, and so it was the magic I'd like to class it as that I started to log, because it had had a beginning in childhood. I was living in strange circumstances where I was living in the cottage at the time, and I knew it was going to get bigger. Instinct. Would you like to say a little bit about those early years in childhood? Um, yes, well, my parents were spiritually aware. They were very interested in healing. So I had absent healing given to me, S didn't know it, but my parents told me later, but I actually saw the healing lights coming towards me. It was quite terrifying. Um, I'd had an electric shock when I was very young by pushing florist wires into an electrical socket, so I knew what electricity was. And to me, seeing the purple and violet light reminded me of the shock. So I was quite frightened about it, um, but obviously psychically aware, as all little children often are. That's where it began. Then about six seven school I was aware of a vicar by my side a clerical gentleman a bit of an intrusion into my childhood and uh, I used to say to the other children can you see him and they couldn't so I sort of then learned that something's going on that other people aren't aware of so uh, very confusing in childhood really mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then about the, uh, the age of 11 this huge feeling in me that I had something to do that was important um, drive I suppose I could describe it as and that's where it all began. So I worked very hard at my education. I knew I had to improve what I was doing. I had to, I'd had a lot of eyesight problems in early life with um, black patches on my eyes. So it retarded me in education. So I arrived at secondary school quite low down the ladder. And I thought, well, if I'm going to achieve what it is I'm going to do, I'm going to have to work really hard. And that's what, well, that's what occurred. So something was going on inside me. I seemed to be getting internal messages uh, about things for the future. Hard to define in childhood, but I was driven. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So for anybody watching this who maybe experienced similar sort of things and, as it were, discounted them because they were unsure, mm. uh, this is one of the, the wonderful things about your story is that you actually were able to un get some understanding of them and build that gradually into a, a base of knowledge and understanding. Yes, yes. It's, I, I mean, I look at children in such a different way these days. I see them all as little magical creative beings and I, sure. I see them heavily suppressed by their upbringing and crushed sometimes by their parents. And I find it quite heartbreaking. I think I was lucky in that my parents were psychically or spiritually aware, but there was also the controversy that they were living, you know, 60 years old, 70 years ago. They were a bit of sh bit of shame, kept it a bit quiet. They were a bit closeted, mm. and mm. Uh, 
that closeting <clears throat> came across to me as you yeah. don't talk to other people about it. So then I had all the controversies of guilt. Yes. Uh, that I was transgressing moral and religious boundaries, and, and that was complicated as well. So I sort of look at little children today as wonderful little magical open books and just hope and pray that their education is going to let them blossom into beautiful beings, because we are all beautiful beings. Mm. It's mm. just that we just get so cramped. So let's take that on to the book itself. What was the inspiration? What was the first point that when you felt that you had to start to write this down and maybe there was a, a book in it, as it were. Uh, I think when I arrived at this cottage, my, Brian and I, my husband and I, we arrived at this thatch cottage in Wimborne, near Wimborne, and we were in our early 20s with two young children and we immediately, we'd had this draw to this cottage, we tried to avoid going to live in this thatch cottage. But when we'd sat in the uh, dining room on the first day with the owner, it was unusual feeling like you'd come home bizarre feeling it's hard to I didn't want to get up and go away I didn't own the house so that's when I the feelings were getting really powerful um, and we hadn't been there living there long that we realized if we went away we just had to keep rushing back to it we then went for advice I, I sought out some psychic mediums to try and help me understand what was going on and we eventually started to get communication from this vicar who had been uh, around that area sometime 400 years prior and then I thought this is really surreal and this was William Thomas and this was William Thomas yeah. he started to communicate through direct trance mediumship in this little dining room of our cottage which was it was exciting it was very unusual because he started to relate not to just this lifetime but he started to go back way back to primitive times, 3,000, or so-called primitive I think they probably slightly sure. saw yeah. uh, sophisticated yeah. Um, yeah you know, mentally wise, um, it was just fascinating beyond all belief. So I logged it. I started to log it. I remembered the things that had happened in childhood. So it wasn't I couldn't it wasn't that I couldn't accept it. I knew there was magic out there, as I like to call it. Mm. So I thought I'd log it because it was obviously gonna lead somewhere. Mm. And it was gonna mm. lead somewhere as fast as I wanted to take it. And I felt by then my um old uh, my parents, my husband's parents were, were starting to hear what was going on. And I felt that I had a, I had to log it for their sakes as well, because they were saying, what are you doing? You know, why aren't you just getting on with your life? But Brian and I had this fascination for the more than. Yeah. And so hence the logging and the journaling began. Mm. I never set out to write a book. Even when I'd gone through 16 years in that cottage and we'd had amazing happenings. I never set out to write a book, but time came to leave the cottage. That in itself was very traumatic because of the circumstances that beset us around there. And I wrote it really as a log for the family to say, look, I know you think we're mad. We've been dealing with so many different layers of life, but this is actually what happened. By then we had sound tapes, video footage. We kept it all. And it was just to let the family see what had happened. And uh, I gave it to an old lady friend of mine. I had an old lady friend who lived in Wimborne who was very interested in what we were about. And... Um, I let her read the log one day and she said, oh, that's, I want to give this to my daughter's friend who's coming to stay for the weekend. She's coming over from New York. She's a literary agent. I said, oh, my gosh, don't do not do that. You think I'm completely <laughs> mad if she reads about my goings on. And I actually met the girl over the weekend and she said, well, Josephine, this is not a, this is not just for your family. You've, you've written a, an amazing record here Indeed. and she said I'm a New York literary agent and, and actually New Age works my forte and she took it back to the USA she said I'll edit it for you and she took out vast chunks of it actually she took out um, some of the more personal stuff not business stuff but personal stuff relating to the death of my father to the death of a very good friend of mine they were both dying at the same time the loss of a great a dog she said look if we if you put all this heartbreak in it People mm. are never going to mm. be able to read it. So I did take out quite a bit of the personal stuff, really. Mm. And then she sent it back to me. And uh, to cut a long story short, I went on originally and self-published that first little block. And that book was called The Return. And uh, that found its way all around the world. But that was just the story of the cottage. And really, that was just my initiation. Those first 16 years in that cottage were the initiate, initiation into a, a completely other dimension of life. Mm. It was mm -hmm. quite a gentle and beautiful and colourful, expansive and uh, very historical, very graphic with lots of video and film footage and 
um, sound recordings of the cleric talking and all the people who'd lived in the area 400 years ago. It was an adventure and a story in itself. And I thought, well, that's it. No one's going to have any more in their life that could be as exciting as that. But in hindsight, I could see it was but an initiation. Yeah. That was the lighter side of it. And then I went on to site after site, which were slightly more of a darker nature. And I had to draw on those reserves and, and the courage to, to live through them and deal with it all. So it certainly isn't a story of uh, a, a bed of roses, so to speak. No. It's life as we as we live it and as yes. we find it. I mean, life's tricky for many people, mm. and um, mm. there's a lot of uh, loss in it because we're business people and we've ridden through two recessions, and now now we're in a third one, and it doesn't get any easier. Mm. You know, we've lived our lives. We've been adventurers, I suppose, self-employed, creative people, live on the edge of a knife, always huge financial constraints. You're bringing up children alongside it, lots of animals, lots of horses, never a dull moment. And uh, yeah, I, th I think my husband and I have lived our life on the edge of a knife, but at least it hasn't been boring. <laughs> Terrifying at times, but yeah. not boring. Yeah, yeah. So would you like to say more about William Thomas? Because obviously to have... Um, you know, we we understand the aspect of of hearing voices and so on, or having guides or, mm -hmm. or uh, angelic forces. People give these things different names, different terms, but to have it seems one consistent voice going on in the background all the time over many years. And I wonder how that uh, how you reacted to that to start with, and when there came a point when you began to trust and realised that the, this mm. in, indeed was an inner voice that you could could trust. Well, obviously I'd seen this cleric by my side in childhood. That wasn't particularly comfortable at times. It made me watch my P's and Q's. I felt I had to behave in a certain manner, so that was an intrusion. Uh, but of course, eventually, this cleric, this vicar, the Reverend William Thomas, starts to communicate through a trance medium in that cottage in Wimborne when I was around 28, 30 years old. That's many years ago. He introduced himself as a vicar who'd lived in the vicinity at that time uh, and started to talk about life not only 400 years ago but back in 3000 BC when Brian and I, by all accounts, had been on the site of this cottage which had been a stone circle. Mm -hmm. Huge, earth-shattering uh, for Brian and I. <laughs> it just was surreal. Yes. But there was yeah. something true because this place felt more than home. We, we were rooted to it. There was something in the land. We knew... It had some sort of energetic content that was intense and passionate. I seem to remember you in the book saying something about even going away, travelling away yes. to go and see friends or family for the weekend. Yes. There was a, a pull. Yes, like an elastic band coming out of the solar plexus and we you, know, you just wanted to rush home to it. It was so good to be there and it took us many years to come to terms with what that was all about and mm. to learn. Mm -hmm. And so this cleric would communicate and he, he sent me on a bit of a wild goose chase trying to track him down. I met my colleague John Lloyd who researched for me and um, really was a backbone for me. He really kept my feet on the ground because I think what was happening to us was very unusual. And um, I, I know my parent, both respective older pe groups of parents were a bit concerned about what was going on in this cottage, you mm. know. There's mm. obviously phenomena there. Mm. Is it good? Is it bad? Is mm. it? Mm. Um, sure. So uh, in the early days, I found it very hard to question the cleric. He'd give us information, but my restraints from childhood, you don't question the cleric, were there. And I'd sort of take what he gave me and work on it eventually when life got quite complicated and tricky there uh, to do with business as well you know we were struggling we had a lot on our plate we had businesses both of us children animals and all this psychic phenomena occurring as well uh, it was then I got a little bit more um, animated and angry <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but I worked out that I would ask questions telepathically of him when the when the, the psychic medium was not available yes yeah. and then he'd answer them <laughs> Right. <laughs> which yeah. was wonderful yeah. so yes. I could see something was going on eventually mm. I learned to communicate with him myself yeah. but that was big yeah. Yeah. I was quite frightened about it I, mm. you know it was it was very unusual mm. 